special edition, our coverage of the ACHA Men's D2 West Regional Tournament. Just ended last weekend. I've got Seth Axison in with me that covered the tournament for us. You may know Seth from the voice of GCU hockey all season long on Black Dog Sports for the most part. Yeah, Black Dog uh, for the most part. That's where all the home games were. Um, and then uh, filled in for the game uh, on Friday night, actually, on ASU's ACHA page. So um, just a quick shout-out to Brett Vaughn now, Cooper. Uh, did a great job on the broadcast, allowed me to come in and, and really work every different role. I did play-by-play, -play, I did color, I did camera, so it taught me a lot and, and I really appreciate them and without them, you know, I'd, a lot of the fans, uh, you know, not only here in Arizona but throughout the, the tournament, you know, Montana, Utah, California, wouldn't have been able to see the games without them. Absolutely. And the uh, tournament, of course, was held here at Oceanside Ice Arena. We're live here, one of our uh, corporate partners at College Bar and Grill, right here on the corner of... Uh, College and Fifth, right across from A Mountain, right down the street from the home of the uh, the uh, Sun Devils and their new uh, hockey facility when it's up and running here in a couple of years. So um, we always appreciate coming in, seeing Nick and the guys, and let's jump right into it. Let's talk a little bit about what happened on the weekend. First of all, some of the teams that were involved: we had Utah State, right? We had Boise State, we had Oregon, we had uh, GCU, we had BYU. Who am I missing? Um, Montana State, okay. who ended up moving on. Uh, Cal State Northridge. Yep. Um, I feel like there's another one, but I'm not. We'll get into it. We'll talk a little bit about these teams. So, as we sit here at, uh, at College Bar and Grill, we're going to recap what happened over the weekend. It was an exciting weekend. First of all, let's give another shout out to uh, ASU and, and Kate Green, the director of uh, ACHA Hockey over there, for the job that they did of putting it on. And of course, Adam Mims over at uh, Oceanside for doing all the work that he did. Not easy to put on a big tournament like that in a small facility like Oceanside, but they pulled it off from what I hear. Yeah, they did. And, you know, it, when you think about running an ice rink in general, right, you want to make sure to, to make sure the business is successful, you're selling the ice time, things like that. And Oceanside, very gracious to pretty much use an entire weekend worth of ice time to make sure this tournament went off without a hitch. And there was never a problem uh, on the ice, you know, with the, the crew at the building. So. It was great all in all for Oceanside and it really shows why uh, ASU, their NCAA team, can still play there because it might be a little bit of a smaller barn, but uh, the facilities and the people who run Oceanside do a fantastic job. Well, you're very familiar with Grand Canyon following them all year long. They were in as a number six seed, so they didn't have to play that first game on Thursday or the first two games on Thursday. They advanced on and had BYU, who uh, they faced earlier in the season, correct? Yeah, they did. And then they uh, lost a, a tight one earlier in the season, a 2-1 to one loss. Um, so you figured that it was going to be a tight one, right? BYU, very right. very structured hockey team. They're not going to let you try and play an up and down game. They're going to kind of go piece by piece, pass by pass up the ice, and if they get the opportunity, they're going to score. So when we look back to Thursday night, the two teams that advanced through that were? Uh, from Thursday night, it ended up being Cal State Northridge right. and, and Utah State. So okay. the two teams that ended up going to Nationals, uh, the extra two teams, should I say, for the West region. Yeah. Both had to win Thursday night, and they did. Awesome. So we look back at what that tournament's like. It's two teams played their way in, essentially, for Friday and Saturday, right? And then there's not a traditional championship game on Saturday. It's uh, two games, and there's a winner from each that will advance, along with our two automatic qualifiers in uh, NAU and Northern Colorado. Yeah, and it, there's really two schools of thought when it comes into, you know, whether you want to play the first night or you want the rest, right? I mean, obviously, I think if you ask any coach, they'd say they want the rest. But you think about it, right? Okay, you come in, you win Thursday, you have the momentum. Your legs are a little bit looser. There's some of these teams who haven't played in maybe a week or two. So you got your legs loose. You have the confidence that you won game one. Okay, we just got to keep winning. And that's what I saw about both Utah State and Montana State. They just had that confidence. They won game one, and they said, okay, we can do this. We believe, and, and they made their way uh, through the tournament. Montana State having to come back from four goals down against Boise State and scoring 0.7 seconds left on a breakaway. It looked like Boise State had uh, maybe kind of accepted that that game was going to overtime. It had a little deflating for them to give right. up that lead, but it seemed like they were kind of giving that, you know, okay, we're going to overtime, and Montana State broke that puck up as fast as they could and scored. And, really showing that determination and want to get out uh, get out to Frisco and they're on their way. 
And there was really no controversy in that. You and I talked off camera, but the clock actually showed 0.7 seconds, right, at the end? Yeah, it wasn't like the, you know, the goal went in and the clock went off. It, no, the, you know, human, I wouldn't say error, but human reaction, right? Yeah. You still got to flick that clock off. Right. And it was in, and even when they flicked the clock off, the board read 0.7. So no doubt about it. Um, no controversy and, uh, you know, no argument from the Boise State bench. Let's talk a little bit about Montana State and their route to get here. I'm sure you're familiar with what it took to get them here. They were planning on bussing down all the snow, the, uh, snow that we've had in, in all over the country, but certainly up in the, uh, the central part of the country, the northwest, I guess, too. Uh, the roads were blocked, basically, by snow, so they were faced with maybe forfeiting and not getting here. Uh, the folks at Allegiant Air stepped up, bought them plane tickets, put them all on a plane, flew them into Tempe, and guess what? Lo and behold, they're going to Frisco, Texas. Yeah, and uh, when you look at Montana State, their social media throughout the weekend, it was all things to Allegiant. They, you know, they understood and, and they really appreciated the the gesture by Allegiant, and I think that inspired them, right? Uh, hey, we don't, we, you know, we got flown down here, let's make something of it. They ended up being beating Cal State Northridge, I think with Montana State, um, they figured out Cal State Northridge wanted to stretch the ice. It's a very fast team, a team that GCU played earlier in the year uh, twice and just saw how fast they were. Um, and they were trying to use their speed, stretch it out, play a stretch game. And they ended up scoring two goals in the first period. Um, and Montana State, you know, kind of figured out the game and said, okay, that's enough. And all of a sudden you see three guys back on defense. You know, there, there's a <laughs> shot, you know, and, and Montana State, you know, set it up on offense. And if even if they saw that they, if there was a rebound and they were like, okay, there's no chance we're getting to that, everybody's going back because they understood Cal State Northridge was going to try and push the pace and uh, they got back on defense and Cal State Northridge was. They were trying those stretch passes and what was happening is they were running into a neutral zone trap of three, four blue sweaters and it just wasn't going anywhere and they stifled Cal State Northridge offensively got in and then scored a couple goals of their own and ended up picking up a 4-2 victory on the first night. You know, when you look at the, the hockey that's played, typically tournament time, it's goaltending, right? Was there goaltenders that stood out to you this weekend or was it pretty much status quo? Uh, definitely Manzella at BYU. Yeah. Um, did shut out GCU. GCU, I think, got stifled a little bit offensively. BYU kind of took the same approach that Montana State did with Northridge where, you know, they didn't let Declan Carter, they didn't let Zach Bennett um, really get the two free. And, you know, once GCU was crossing the blue line, uh, they were right on him. So, um, I, you know, they kind of forced GCU to play the outside a little bit and dump the puck in. And uh, But Manzella had to make a few really good saves uh, against GCU. I mean, uh, there were a few times, especially in that first period, where GCU could have had one, even two goals. And uh, Manzella held strong. And uh, Manzella played really well. So... And that's a goaltender that stood me. Even though they ended up uh, losing the next uh, the next day, um, he definitely uh, probably had the best goaltending performance of the tournament out of any goalie. All right, Seth, let's take a quick break. We'll come right back and we'll talk a little bit about GCU and how they fared. We'll talk a little bit about the automatic qualifier from here in the desert southwest, Northern Arizona University. And then we'll take another break and we'll come back and wrap things up with uh, the two other teams that are advancing and just how they got there. Sounds good. We'll be right back. Pre-game like a pro, post-game like a champion at College Bar and Grill. Located across the street from the iconic A Mountain and Sun Devil Stadium and a quick walk from Wells Fargo Arena, College Bar and Grill is your home for the best local craft beer, delicious creative cocktails, tasty food, and Tempe's best atmosphere for Arizona State Athletics. College Bar and Grill, pre-game like a pro, post-game like a champion. Online at ilovecollege.co. All right, folks, we're back at uh, College Bar and Grill right here in Tempe, Arizona, right next to the iconic A Mountain just outside of Sun Devil Stadium. And you'd think we'd be talking all ASU, but, but this weekend, ASU hosted the, the ACHA Men's D2 West Regional. Seth was there for us all weekend, had a chance to take a first-hand view of it. I, unfortunately, was in the, uh, the upper Midwest in Minnesota freezing my little tail off, to be honest with you, as... Uh, the Arizona State Sun Devils NCAA team played their final two games of the regular season in Minnesota. So, Seth, I want to thank you personally for stepping in for me and, and giving me all the uh, the insight of this tournament. Of course, yeah, it was a, a great time and a, a chance to really see what the best of uh, ACHA Division II has to offer. As we talk West Region, 
A lot of people don't realize how big that west region is, right? I mean, it stretches into Montana, Colorado, all the way to the west coast. But GCU was one of the teams, we briefly talked about that, getting into it. For those that don't know, GCU is advancing to the next level in ACHA hockey next year. There'll be a men's D1 team after just, what, three years of, of regular hockey? Yeah, so three years hockey. at the Division II level, and they their main team is moving up uh, to Division One. They will still have a Division II team. Um, but that won't be their uh, their main team. So the D3 team essentially will move to D2? Correct. So there will be no more Division Three team for GCU, but um, that moves to Division II. Uh, GCU's uh, A team or Team 1, if, if you will, going to head to Division 1. And I think it just it speaks to not only the growth of the program, but what, what Danny Roy wants to build, right? right. A, yep. You know, he's not waiting around. He's not messing around. Okay, we're going to go D1. And from day one, when you talk to him, yes. The goal was ACHA Division One. Right. Now, if you ask him about a, a goal of maybe going NCA Division One, I, I think uh, he, you know he feels that it's a little farther off in the future. But hey, I, we saw how long it took ASU and how much money it really takes to get to an NCA Division One level. So I think right now it's about establishing that foundation. Even though they are moving fast, um, I think you're going to see GCU stay and, and even be a powerhouse at the ACHA Division level, Division One level for a long time. Well, the great part about that is it adds another a ACHA D1 team down here. So we've got Grand Canyon, we've got ASU, we've got U of A, we've got UNLV, all in the desert southwest. So that's going to save some costs travel-wise, which I'm sure they're looking forward to. But let's quickly touch on this. We talk about the money it, talks, it takes to jump to NCAA, but Coach Powers has been stern in this idea that you shouldn't advance to NCAA one until you dominate ACHA D1. He won a national championship, then made the jump. So for teams like U of A, they're having a great season. Grand Canyon jumping in, UNLV's having a pretty good season. ASU was a little bit down this year, but you really need to get in to ACHA D1 and win, right? Right. And that's not an easy tournament to win, as we're going to find out coming up here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and it's not like uh, Division Two or Division Three. There's no regionals. You have right. to be one of those top teams to go. So, I mean, uh, with you know Utah State, Montana State played their tails off when it mattered the most. But right. when, you, when you see a situation like that at a Division One level, a team that maybe didn't have the greatest season, Unfortunately for a team like that, they're not going to have an opportunity at a regional. I mean, we're coming up on uh, NCAA basketball tournament time, and you'll see teams with under 500 wow. records because they won conference tournaments. Right. So it's a little bit of a different animal. Um, and for GCU, they're going to have to find a way to, to be dominant right away. And I, I don't think they're going to be dominant right away. I mean, I don't want to come out and say that, you know, and call an early, oh, GCU is going to you know, be the best team <laughs> in Division One. They definitely have a lot of talent that is Division One compatible. But it, when you talk to Daniel, I talked to him last year after they played uh, ASU before they're heading into their U of A series at the beginning of the year. And he said, look, I think we played really well. There's a lot of things that we positive we can take. But that's uh, that's something we have to keep up for a 30-game stretch when we're at the Division One level. That's the level of hockey. You know, they're not playing Division One teams six, seven times a year. They're playing them 30 times a year now. Yeah, so right, right. it's about, uh, you know, those players who will be on the Division One team next year uh, finding that next step and, and playing at that level 100% uh, all the time. And, it, and I think we've seen really both sides of the coin for GCU. They've, they've beaten U of A before. They've beaten them right. twice, actually, in the last yeah. two years. And they've also been um, beaten pretty bad by... U of A as well on the flip side. So I think uh, there's a lot of positive that you can see, hey, these players can compete at this level, right. but it's about finding that consistency and doing it night in and night out. Yeah, well, when we talk about GCU, I know nobody really wants to talk about it because it was a three low loss. It's the only team that didn't score in the tournament. I know there's a lot of frustration there, but there's a lot of bright spots to look forward to with the program. One of the teams that was the automatic qualifier, which GCU competed against over the last few years is, is Northern Arizona. They uh, were a team that didn't even have to go to the regional. They qualified automatically as the number one seed along with Northern Colorado at number two. Talk a little bit about what you saw out of NAU this year and specifically the games against GCU. How can we kind of size them up for the tournament? NAU is an interesting story. At the beginning of the year, they were not playing as well. GCU actually went up to yeah. uh, Le uh, the Life, Jay Emma. Lively, yep, and they beat NAU twice, and NAU was kind of stumbling. I was like, well, you know, is NAU done? Like, are they, you know, are they gonna <laughs> pick it up? And by goodness, they picked it up because they came down to GCU. They uh, they didn't lose a game at Arcadia, right? Um, and NAU figured it out, and with the talent they have, right? It just 
they they have to they have to you know a guy like Maxima who just too talented they just have too much talent on that team they figured it out they got themselves uh, to nationals on an automatic bid so a very very good effort and a lot of those guys a lot of their top talent are seniors they understood that this is their last ride their last time out and I think at the start of the year they realized that this is not the way we want to go out we don't want to struggle we don't want to have to go to regionals and fight our way in and uh, they strapped in played as a team and a lot of those guys have been playing together for uh, for a long time so uh, they really kind of clicked again uh, like they usually have and uh, making their way towards nationals absolutely we'll give a shout out to coach Johansson uh, does a fantastic job just keep recycling people right I mean they never seem to have a down year they always seem to have talent coming in and you touched on the uh, the seniors that are there played a long time together I know he's very proud of that group and what they put together and I think they really want to do something at the national tournament for years they've gotten there maybe haven't gotten as far as they want but I think they really want to try to capture that crown and see what they can do well, I think this is their best time, right? They got a lot of veteran guys who have a ton of talent. Um, next year is going to be, I think, very interesting for NAU. They are losing a lot of their top mm -hmm. talent, but it's like you said, they're they're very good at just keeping keeping that train moving, bringing in talent, and, and really making sure uh, that they're always at the top of their game. So I think for NAU, um, uh, this is going to be a big time to uh, show what they have in the national tournament, and then you know, for their for their sake, you know, hopefully they get far get themselves even to a national championship and then um, it's all about uh, getting ready for next year as well and, and making sure that talent uh, the talent they're bringing in and the talent they have is uh, ready to go for maybe another nationals run well as you probably saw on camera if you weren't and you're listening on the podcast there's a uh, the college bar and grill is not only a bar right it's a grill <laughs> we've got their special today the uh, the dean as we like to say nick cooked us up some uh, bacon mac and cheese cheeseburgers with fries got them in front of us we're not going to eat them now we're going to tempt everybody with them on camera while we talk a little bit more about uh, ACHA men's D2 hockey but thanks again to College Bar and Grill for stepping up and helping us out on all of our broadcasts and as a corporate partner let's uh let's talk a little bit about the trip the, to the national tournament right I know GCU wanted to go and you would have been a part of that group I know it's just frustrating from that standpoint of it but it's not in Ohio this year. It's in Frisco, Texas, a fantastic facility, a little warmer in mid-March than Ohio. Your thoughts on Frisco, Texas, and what that's going to bring for these teams from the West that are headed there? Well, I think it's interesting. I think it's a very, uh, a more centrally located place in Ohio, right? I know it's a little bit farther for the Eastern team, but it's you know going to Ohio for a team like Montana State, Utah State. That's a, that's a heck of a flight and, and a heck of a bus ride too. Um, and I think this is really going to set the tone for hockey in the Southwest. I don't want to say like overall, but in the ACHA, right? Yeah, okay. right. Beautiful facility in Frisco, Texas. The Stars practice facility. We know the Stars have established themselves in Texas. They have yep. themselves a Stanley Cup. Um, but I think if if this is pulled off correctly and runs really well, which I believe it will, I, you know, Stars are a world class organization and, and their facilities are fantastic. Um, but I think I think it'll show that hey. You know, a team in the South can host uh, a right. regional, and right. I know they try to keep it a little more centrally located. But hey, I um, I don't know how happy Coach Powers would be, but maybe <laughs> when that new facility is built, uh, the ACHA may come knocking on the door and say, "Hey, the way we can come hang out here for for a week or you know right. ten days, which is you know, in the ACHA Nationals, it's it's a ten day stretch, right? Yeah. Uh, it's got all the women's tournaments, it's got all the men's yeah. tournaments, and Arizona. I mean, uh, when you really think about it, it's kind of a, the same in terms of the amount of ice time you can have uh, yeah. you can literally spread out an entire ACHA tournament over the valley right. you got a, a rink in Peoria you got a rink in Chandler a rink in Gilbert a rink in Scottsdale two rinks in Tempe yeah. you got Gila River and, I mean you have so many rinks so where you know you don't have to condense yourself yeah. to two rinks and when you really think about it you go to AZ Ice Gilbert they have a two ice, two sheet facility yep. AZ Ice Peoria two sheet facility Ice Den in Scottsdale two sheet facility you could really have one you know division tournament at each of these different facilities um, and so I think depending on how this goes and, and how well it's run I, you could maybe see an ACHA tournament leak down to a place uh, like Arizona or even you know head up a, a little farther north to Vegas they're right. starting to 
you know, <laughs> with the nights blown up. I and mean, they're getting another couple of ice sheets up there. Exactly. Henderson. Exactly. So uh, you could do the same thing, right? I mean, you could even go to City National. There's only two sheets there. Yep. And, you, you know, you just do a 10-day thing. And I think a lot of club hockey teams wouldn't say no to Vegas if you told them that's where the Nationals <laughs> would be. So. Well, we've been around. This is our fourth year now on Ice Time Hockey Southwest. And you've been around for a while watching this, but... Did you ever think it was hockey was going to grow in the desert like it has right now from the root levels up? I mean, we talk about Austin Matthews, obviously, is the obvious one. But we also talk a little bit about the growth of ASU's NCAA program and the future of that. Look in your crystal ball for us, Seth, as we wrap things up here and tell me where you see uh, hockey in the desert southwest in 10 years. In 10 years, it's all going to depend on the success of the Knights and the Coyotes. Right. It, it will. Because it, with Phoenix, you know, when you hear, oh, you know, hockey doesn't work in Phoenix and why is it still there? Look, this is a top 10 mar population wise big market in the U.S. And I'm not sure how long you've lived here. I've lived here my whole life. This is a very fair weather town. I hate to say it, but it, it is. It is. It is. I mean, you, you even see it at ASU football. When ASU football is doing really well, you can't buy a ticket in the Sun Devil right. Stadium. But sure. if ASU football maybe has a little bit of a down year, it. You're looking at Sun Devil Stadium, and there, you know, you can, you can count the open seats. You're going to need an XL spreadsheet to count yeah. those. So, if the Coyotes are doing good, you know, I, I don't know if you were here in 2012. I was. When they went to the Western Conference Finals, you know, they were sell selling standing room only tickets, and they were selling at a standing room only ticket. In the so, middle of summer. In the middle of summer. And so, <laughs> it's a fair weather town. You know, people say, oh, it doesn't belong here. This is the Coyotes' opportunity to, to get it going. The Suns are in a down year. The D-backs are in an interesting position. The Cardinals, uh, hopefully they can turn things around, but they had uh, their worst season, uh, I think, ever since they've been in Arizona. Yeah, I think you're right. So this is the Coyotes' time. Um, now, I think ASU hockey is going to survive uh, a long time, not only yeah. with the money standpoint, but, yeah. uh, be, you know, the, like you said, the grassroots level of hockey. What kid from Minnesota or Ontario or Alberta is going to say no to come, you know, hey, you know, you're getting some of these offers and, you know, you might not be getting, you know, it doesn't sound like you're going to get the playing time you want. We think you're very talented. Um, but, I mean, we're seeing recruiting by Coach Powell. I mean, Kuzman Z is coming in. At, I mean, uh, you want to talk well, about... Well, we, we got a Briere coming. we got a Niedermeyer yeah. coming. And we already have a Lemieux. Lemieux. That's a pretty good start. Yeah, and, you know, a guy like Johnny Walker, he's back to the grassroots, who's yeah. uh, yep. current, still leading the NCAA in goals, correct? Correct. He's tied for top. So tied for top. I, I mean, you got Joey DeCord from Massachusetts who was drafted before he even came to ASU. I mean, and, when you see a... made the trip here. Yeah, and when you see a goaltender get drafted, uh, colleges are all over him. Yeah. I, I yeah. mean, it's it's insane. So, um, I think ASU is going to survive a long time. There's a lot of kids who want to come here and play. There's a lot of opportunity. Um, but in the desert southwest, it is. It's all hinges on how well the Coyotes do. They do they do a great job of making sure kids are signing up for hockey. I mean, yeah, hockey in Arizona. Are great. Yeah, every year. I mean, it seems like the numbers are coming out and they've, you know, 100% growth, it seems, every year in the state of Arizona. So um, the Coyotes are performing really well and it seems like they've set themselves up really well, at least for the next two or three years, if not even more. So um, I think you're going to see the Coyotes make the playoffs. I think you're going to see ASU, you know, make the tournament for years to come. And I think with ACHA Division One having all three, uh, three of the four schools yeah. in ACHA Division One and UNLV, Vegas already making the Stanley Cup playoffs. I, all of a sudden, I think you're going to see this become a, a hockey mecca. That's uh, that's positive and that's good. And I believe you 100. percent I think it's going to grow quicker than people uh, give it credit for. I never would have expected to be where we are right now. We'll wrap things up. We'll dig into our. Uh, Bacon, Mac, and Cheeseburgers here at uh, College Barn Grill. Another shout out to them for uh, hosting us here today. We'll follow along the uh, ACHA tournament. We'll follow along, of course, the growth of uh, GCU hockey as they continue to go. I know they got prospect camps and things coming up, so uh, follow along with us on that. Seth, thanks for stepping in as always. Every time I ask, you're always available, and I always appreciate it. Um, what more can we say, but let's play hockey in the desert. Let's play hockey, and uh, hopefully next year, we're talking about three teams heading to ACHA Division One Nationals. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be unbelievable? I don't know. You and I are going to have to make a trip. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. that, that's when we got to start lobbying for uh, the tournament to be in Arizona <laughs> if all three teams are going. Exactly. We'll look forward to it. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, stay tuned at College Hockey Southwest Weekly as well as IcetimeHockeySW.com. Our podcasts, our uh, webcasts. You can see us. You can watch us. You can listen to us. We're everywhere, folks.